So this will be relatively uh, quick today, but I think we wanted to recap on some of the themes that were just brought up in the influencer panel, because I think when we talk to brands, um, and as social media has evolved and content's evolved, I think probably the single biggest question we're getting on the content side is exactly what those guys were, were asking, is how do we really build this kind of organic word of mouth? So wanted to, as we typically do at L2, kind of look at this through the lens of some of our data. Um, and gonna break this down really into three separate sections. First, I think talking about celebrities. Second, about more of the long tail of influencers. And then I think finally looking at advocates because I think when we look at these three levers, I would argue all three have become more and more powerful as consumers increasingly move their behavior online. So first with celebrity. Um, so headline of the week actually wasn't uh, Trump's cabinet for once, um, and instead, we would argue Kendall Jenner moving off of Instagram. Um, and I think it's interesting uh, when in this era, and, I, and it's, it's, it's funny, only this week would uh, Jenner actually be refreshing news. Um, <laughs> but the, um, I think when you look at kind of the fundamental relationship that we've built with celebrities, it's now absolutely kind of completely interconnected with social media. And it was funny kind of pinging around Kendall's content, and we'll get back to some of her brand partnerships in a second. Um, what absolutely shocked me is that, while Kendall's still very active on Twitter, when you click through to the majority of links in her content, she's actually, actually linking to a branded blog where, where consumers have to pay $2.99 a month to subscribe to her latest beauty fashion tips, most of which she's already kind of getting um, a commission on the back end from her relationship with brands. So these guys have just become ridiculous kind of money-making machines. And it's, there's a reason for this, and this is looking at some of our fashion content um, from our 2016 study. Um, when we look overall at top performing posts, and this is specifically on brand channels, we'll talk about celebrity channels on a, in a second. While products still reign supreme, celebrity has an undeniable in, uh, influence, and specifically celebrity on Instagram. And I think that, that makes intuitive sense, um, but it's shocking that the Kendalls and the Justins continue even on branded platforms to have that authenticity um, that consumers uh, like and that they uh, definitely engage with across these platforms. What we did here was look specifically on the x-axis at the, at the number of posts featuring celebrity, and this is across the 78 brands in our fashion index, and along the y-axis really looking at the number of index brands kind of mentioning celebrities. So if you look at Gigi Hadid, literally working with about 34 of the brands within our fashion index, and this is just over kind of a, a, a year-long period. So these guys are promiscuous in terms of the products they promote. And not surprisingly, it's a lot of the models that are walking in runway shows and collaborating kind of with brands. Um, it's interesting, we didn't necessarily um, see, however, which we'll look at China in a second, a relationship between kind of the influence of these celebrities having kind of any smaller influence if they were working with multiple brands. Here you can see kind of the, the celebrity power index, um, and it's crazy how interconnected these guys are. This is looking effectively at the amplification effect when a celebrity posts branded content on their platform. So you have um, former power couple uh, Justin and Selena taking kind of the top spot, a lot of Kardashians up there, a number of kind of uh, Taylor Swift's girl squad, although Taylor herself actually doesn't make kind of that top 10 list. Um, but it's amazing, again, how a lot of these manufactured social media celebrities. The other thing that was really interesting for us is that in the celebrity ecosystem, the long tail is not that long. There's really between 10 to 20 celebrities that are commanding the reach that you see of these top 10. So it's been harder and harder, I think, for brands um, around some of these celebrity partnerships. It, it, it's also funny when you look at kind of what you're paying these celebrities for. Um, it, I always kind of hearken back to a conversation I had with the CEO of PVH, who was absolutely flabbergasted the check he was writing to both Kendall and Justin to create Snapchat content that effectively disappeared. Um, 
Then you look at some of the best brands. Um, so I think Belmont, and you do see a number of brands kind of on more of the indie side who have done this really, really well. Um, this is looking at the number of celebrity mentions they have uh, with their content. And uh, again, a lot of this is getting kind of um, product into the hands of these celebrities. You can look at just the overwhelming reaction that they're getting to a lot of this Instagram content. And it's hearkening back again to, I think, a lot of the things that were just shared on the panel. Very authentic. It doesn't look like it's being promoted. And you see this dramatically kind of extending the reach of a lot of their social content. I think there's no surprise that they collaborated with H&M because that really provides an instant kind of outlet to monetization. And then let's look at China because I think when we look at celebrity in China, everything effectively gets on steroids. Um, here you can see the top um, posts on Weibo. You can see overwhelmingly do uh, uh, dominated by Burberry. Um, Dior as well, kind of huge content. And every single one of the top posts on Weibo features a celebrity. What's interesting around celebrity in China is that male celebrities versus female celebrities tend to resonate much more kind of with uh, a lot of um, both fashion and beauty brands. And it's a lot of these kind of Gen Z males um, that are models, musicians, um, kind of in their older teenage years or early 20s that really tend to be kind of the arbiters of influence there. Um, here you can just see the tremendous outsized influence that a brand like Dior with 12% of total Weibo interactions or a brand like Burberry are getting. And again, this is almost uh, entirely dependent on their celebrity uh, content. I think the difference that we see in China, which is very different than the ecosystem over here, is celebrity content and influencer content in the US and in Western, uh, in a lot of Western countries, very difficult to link directly to a sales goal. In China, with the advent of live streaming, and if anybody kind of was able to tune into the extravaganza that was Singles Day, it really puts our Super Bowl um, halftime show to shame. Shopping has become effectively a sport in China. And it's a huge kind of entertainment, um, uh, it has a huge entertainment capacity. In front and center in a lot of these experiences are celebrities, where celebrities will go in, into a format that makes HSN or um, a lot of our TV selling look absolutely kind of archaic. Um, and we'll do as much one hour, two hour broadcasts where they're selling key products, some of which they themselves have created or manufactured, some of which are in collaboration with brands. And here you can see an example kind of specifically from Maybelline where they sold about 10,000 lipsticks um, and attracted about 5 million views working with Angela Baby. So back to Kendall, because I think we, we can't, we can't kind of let her go yet. She's erased her Instagram account and obviously one of her biggest brand partners and she's actually quite a good spokesperson here has been Estee Lauder. She's even admitted that she doesn't use her sister Kylie's lip kit because she prefers the products with Estee Lauder. But let's look at the impact of Kendall's kind of uh, uh, canceling of her Instagram account. So when we look specifically at Estee Lauder's Instagram and we look at Kendall's Instagram, about 7% of the Estee Lauder Instagram content um, features Kendall Jenner and actually at links to her. About 3%, so a pretty healthy percentage of Kendall's content also links uh, specifically to the Estee Lauder platform. And now we shift to engagement. When you look at the posts by Kendall featuring Estee Lauder, the, the pie here looks at Estee Lauder's total Instagram engagement over time. Overnight, with the deleting of Kendall's Instagram account, they effectively lost about two-thirds of all of their engagement kind of on the platform. And if you think about this in the context of celebrity partnerships and contracts, imagine if you contracted with a celebrity for a print ad or for a television commercial, and they effectively said they were moving away from the medium and you had to pull all of that content. It's just absolutely kind of ludicrous. But interesting, again, to see the impact that that can have. Let's look a little bit at the longer tail of influencers. Um, this is from a recent Hyper Joffrey study that actually showed that about 11% of upper income teens share of wallet is now spent on beauty products, the highest percentage that we've seen kind of since the history of the survey. And these are the top five products for upper income teens. So 
A lot of the, the usual suspects, Mac at number one, Maybelline at number two, Urban Decay at number three, CoverGirl number four, kind of sneaking in there as a stalwart, and then um, Estee Lauder's recent acquisition, Too Faced, at number five. And when you look at the power of influencers, this is looking at the top brands from an influencer mention standpoint, four of the top five most loved brands by teens are also in the top 10 in terms of influencer mentions. And when you look at the growth of those brands, for the most part via NPD numbers, they fluctuate almost one to one with what's happening in the influencer community. Now what's more interesting is looking at the trend. Because you see of these top 10, almost every single brand is down, with the exception of Anastasia Beverly Hills, which for the first time actually took the top spot from MAC. We've been tracking this for the better part of the last three years. Um, Anastasia has been more of a one-trick pony, which we'll talk about in a second, on the Instagram platform, has extended their influence to YouTube and to other influencer platforms, and is also the fastest growing brand here in the US. The decrease here from a MAC cosmetic standpoint is ironic because this is also the first year in the, of the last 20 where MAC actually declined in sales. So they have been at the top of these influencer um, indexes for a while and are starting to see kind of that payoff also from a business perspective. Um, mention, kind of returning to, to Anastasia, and I think Anastasia is a brand that's relied almost extensively kind of on influencers, and we've talked about them a lot kind of at L2 events. And here you can see specifically kind of their average posts per week along the x-axis, and then the incredible amount of engagement that they get along the y-axis. Now, when brands kind of re really rely on user-generated content, we get a lot of kind of nervousness, particularly from luxury CEOs, around the ability to kind of curate um, some of those looks. And you can see, you know, Anastasia, there's definitely a look, but they've done a fantastic job of kind of putting that through filters. Now, the interesting thing is, is they've also done a fantastic job, despite the fact that none of these posts links directly kind of to purchase products of commercializing this experience. Um, so when we look kind of specifically at the breakdown of their influencers, about 50% of their influencers are here in the US. And then you see the remaining 50% really evenly split between other regions, including about one in five from Western Europe, a pretty significant presence in Australia and New Zealand. This corresponds almost one to one with where Anastasia is in the process of doing exclusive Sephora launches. And what they've done is rather than doing traditional above the line marketing for the last six months, they've seeded influencer content in key regions that they're looking to expand and then have coupled that kind of with an exclusive launch platform specifically on Sephora. Um, when we look at kind of what's happening on Sephora, and Sephora is a huge fan of Anastasia Beverly Hills, you can see that the product is instantly kind of popping to the top of search results and to the top of bestsellers, again, based on a lot of that influencer content that's being built, as well as kind of those partnerships with Sephora. Um, this also very much kind of links to, from a consumer behavior perspective, what we see the Sephora platform being great at. And this was kind of staggering data that we saw. So when we looked at overall open rates, of both Sephora and Ulta, and looked at some of the subject lines that are referenced kind of specifically within those open rates. Sephora is able to get more than twice the read rate on an email that mentions an exclusive product than it does on, a, on an email that mentions uh, giving the consumer something free, a sample or a product. Um, and I think this just shows the role Sephora continues to play in terms of the discovery of new product. Now, um, Anastasia is, not, uh, is, is definitely not being silly here. They've recognized that if they build a business that's 80, 90, 100% Sephora, that that's not necessarily sustainable from a channel perspective. And it's been really interesting, even in some of their emerging markets, they're seeding product in third-party marketplaces that's being officially distributed, one, to kind of broaden their international distribution, but two, to kind of pull that counterpoint with Sephora and to effectively play a little bit of offense on some of the margin that they're getting from their channels. Um, and, and Anastasia actually is selling here 
on Amazon in the US, not through the luxury beauty store, um, but in the third party marketplace where they're actually listing the same customer service number that they have on their DTC website. Now this is not all just beauty. Um, this is content kind of from the Four Seasons Instagram channel. And when you look at this content, all highly curated, you would, ex I think, kind of what you would come to expect from a brand uh, positioned like the Four Seasons. And it's virtually indistinguishable which of this content has been created by the brand and which of this content has been created by consumers. So you see about half of the content up there, the ones hashtagged um, here, was actually created by consumers and influencers um, versus the other half which the brand itself had curated. And I think a lot of high-end brands in particular have done a really good job of communicating brand codes. Um, when we look kind of specifically at Four Seasons um, Instagram strategy and their advocacy strategy more broadly, about 13% of all engagements specifically on Instagram and hospitality um, are Four Seasons. Um, almost 70% of their content is user generated. And they're actually really inciting consumers and the broader base of influencers to create that content specifically on their website. So let's move into advocacy. Um, and when we look at advocacy, this obviously takes a whole host of different avenues. I think um, the one we're gonna focus most on today is user reviews, and we're gonna take a little bit of a departure from the fashion and beauty world for a second. I think the thing that brands oftentimes don't rec recognize when they're thinking about user reviews is that the user review ecosystem that penetrates kind of your brand is much broader than what's on your brand site and what's on uh, preferred channels of distribution. And actually the consumer for the most part when they're looking at product reviews, they're not necessarily going to your site or to another controlled environment where you have people typically monitoring um, reviews and making sure that they're curating. They're starting that search typically on search engines like Google or Bing. And kind of taking a departure here for a second, this can be really damaging kind of for particular categories of brands. We're gonna talk about roguing. Um, so a non-traditional kind of business um, for L2. When a consumer searches kind of for the all important search, why is my hair thinning? Only 9% of the results on Google actually suggest that that causes Hereditary. If you look at the actual kind of uh, medical and clinical definition behind that, you see that the reality is that the likelihood of it being genetic or androgenetic alopecia, which is the really the clinical state that Rogaine solves for, almost is flipped. 90% of hair loss is caused by genetics, and, that, and that's just the reality. Um, and all of the other things that Google and review sites and why am I balding.com kind of tell you is that it's physical stress, emotional stress, your hairstylist has put something in your hair that's just causing it to fall out. Um, and the reality is, is if you look at actually the average product life cycle for Rogaine, the consumer is trapped in this virtual uh, research cycle for about 10 months. Now what most people don't know about Rogaine is if you don't start using it at the kind of first signs of hair loss, it really doesn't work. Um, so in that 10 month cycle, kind of consumers are effectively, in many cases, deeming the product no longer kind of right for them. This is even further exacerbated because when you look at the Rogaine product, you actually have to be using that product for an average of five months to begin to see results. In the world of Amazon, where a consumer can fulfill a user review, typically after as, much, as little as one usage, this has been an absolute disaster kind of for the Rogaine brand team. So you can see sort of the average hero rating of their product at about 3.2. That does not drive a lot of confidence or conversion kind of on the Amazon platform. They also under index substantially in reviews. They, they kind of, they are aware of this review problem. So rather than leaning in and trying to figure it out, they've kind of leaned back and really tried to carefully curate reviews um, such that they don't expose themselves to kind of some of this negativity. You can see um, just some of these reviews, not worth it, actually accelerated hair loss, complaints about smell, um, no change at all. And six of the 29 kind of total reviews on the Rogaine site itself were one star, and they actually had no reviews um, that were on their product detail pages from 2016. 
When you look at a lot of these user reviews, obviously efficacy is kind of first and foremost, but almost always the consumer cited that they weren't using the product for the full five months. But you also saw issues with product texture, side effects, the applicator itself. And in many cases, this was actually an opportunity for Rogaine to get the consumer to, sh to shift from gel to foam or to another product kind of within their portfolio. Furthermore, this has caused a huge dilemma from a search perspective. Because they've under-invested in reviews, they actually have much less visibility on both Amazon search and on Google search. And that the consumer that's searching for Rogaine is much more likely to be relying on branded search versus a competitor in an upstart kind of in the hair loss space, Pira de Or, um, where about 98% of the searches that are directing to their product detail pages are unbranded. We look kind of specifically at kind of how Rogaine's managing this from a retailer perspective. They've managed Amazon almost exactly like they'd managed the, the Walmart shelf. So when you click through to Amazon and you click to kind of the personal care section, and then you click to hair care, and then you click to hair loss, Rogaine looks great. They control about 33% of kind of that landing page. However, when the consumer searches for hair loss, which is preferred by about 90% uh, about of Amazon consumers, they only own one of those first results. And here you can see Pura de Or owning about 16% of hair loss related searches on Amazon, and a lot of that is well-optimized content that they're getting from their reviews. Not surprisingly, when you look at kind of the growth story, um, Rogaine is largely one of those businesses that's losing more and more relevance every year. While Pira de Or, which arguably has less efficacy, has fewer kind of active ingredients, is up about 195% on e-commerce. So how do you fight back? It's really difficult, I think, to fight back against negative reviews. And, and I think Rogaine is a definitely a product category that's even more challenging. But I think this case study from Benefit was really interesting and it kind of combines a lot of the things that we've been talking about um, today. So Benefit, great brand with influencers, uh, did a fantastic job for their, their um, liquid eyeliner launch back in 2014 of seeding this product with a ton of influencers and really getting those influencers kind of to review product on Sephora. Now the challenge was the applicator for their liquid eyeliner was actually really difficult to use. And before they had even launched the product, you saw kind of a lot of these kind of mediocre reviews on Sephora, um, really complaining about how difficult it was. And a lot of these hyper influencers, I didn't uh, include kind of their profiles, but almost all of these guys were VIB and VIB Rouge um, on Sephora. Um, had really kind of complained that they couldn't get the eyeliner to come on smoothly. Um, what Benefit did, which was absolutely brilliant to kind of get those reviews back in line, is they began a targeted sort of omni-channel campaign with email. We're actually able to track back specifically any consumer who purchased, purchased the liquid eyeliner and they entered them into basically an email stream of how-to videos how to apply videos, offered them kind of, um, offered them uh, free samples and encouraged them to review the product and were actually able to get that, uh, those reviews back significantly. But quickly, just beyond Rogaine, which obviously has a lot of clinical implications, do you wanna just quickly talk about how much do reviews really matter? Because we do spend a lot of time with user reviews um, and I think at your brands, you spend a lot of time kind of reviewing that content. What I would say first and foremost is reviews are incredibly important for SEO. They're important for conversion. They're important for relevance. And if you don't have reviews, we actually see huge downstream uh, traffic patterns onto other sites. That said, when you look at a consumer, from a consumer behavior perspective, what reviews actually tell us. If you look, so this is, these are popular reviews on Best Buy for TVs. Um, so these are the most popular kind of nouns and adjectives that come up. So smart features, price quality, ease of use, setup, price. Does anyone have any idea what brand that would be? Take a guess. It's probably one of three. So Samsung. So let's go to the next one. Picture quality, sound quality, price, setup. Sony. 
um, 4K quality, so a little bit differentiated, and then you still see picture quality and price, and that's LG. So when you really start, we did a ton of analysis of user reviews. For the most part, competitive products are not that different. Um, diapers, here you can see kind of a whole host of terms on Amazon. Perfect, good, love, leaks, not a good forward-looking indicator. Huggies, brand, nice, don't. Pampers is the brand. And then when you similarly look at the word cloud for Huggies, about 90% of the adjectives actually overlap. It's almost indistinguishable if you really do sort of granular analysis. And this is really the law of large numbers. These reviews have gotten so, um, there's so many reviews on these platforms that the consumer can really use the reviews to kind of tell them anything that they want. The reality is, is you have to have a star rating between 4.2 and 4.3. It's kind of the cost of entry. You have to have great products. And all of the rest of it is, to a certain extent, is a little bit of noise. Um, then we looked at fragrance. And we wanted to look at brands across different price points. Because when you look, and this is specifically on uh, the uh, Sephora platform. So travel friendly, good value, fresh and floral. That was Marc Jacobs fragrance, which retailed on the platform for about $80. Travel friendly, good value, reusable. Paco Rabanne, about $16 cheaper. And then when we look specifically, um, travel friendly, good value, reusable, almost exactly the same adjectives, Hermes at $118. So again, consumers virtually in every Chanel fragrance on the Sephora platform, the number one adjective that was used was good value, which uh, even Tom Ford, which retailed for $540 um, on Sephora, for some reason was a great value for the consumers that had bought it. So I think it's really difficult to, it's difficult um, to, to kind of tell some of the differences. It's, again, not to undermine kind of the importance of user reviews. And actually, there's been a lot of academic research that showed that the number one kind of correlation between a positive review is actually a branded product and price point that consumers tend to feel more favorable when they're going with a trusted brand and when they're paying a higher rate. Um, so final, and this is more fun than anything, um, we did find a fragrance that had quite kind of a variety of different adjectives that were kind of being used. So everything from pickle, which came up quite significantly, to sour, synthetic, boring, generic, bad, um, and this is actually a fragrance that was released in 2004. Does anybody have a guess what fragrance this would be? Angel, it's not Angel. Angel actually is very well reviewed. It was Donald Trump <laughs> the experience. So even back in 2004, and he actually uh, launched this with uh, Estee Lauder, not getting good reviews kind of in the beauty community. So. With that, um, we'll close up and get you guys back to work. Um, but thank you so much for your time today. All the presentations and videos will be online.